Hello Penguinauts, I'm the Beardy Penguin and welcome back to For All Kerbal Kind. Kicking off today's episode, unlocking early RTGs, which gives us access to the Snap 9 series RTG, which will be very important later on in the episode. But in the meantime, we're launching ourselves a new space station, although this one is a little different. This is a civilian space station akin to Salyut 1, though hopefully this time it will actually work and be able to sustain a crew long enough that we can finally complete that first space station contract. Now excuse me if I sound a little scratchy, I have been deathly ill for a week so it's a good thing I recorded most of this last weekend but we're going to push through. So this is actually going into a 63 degree inclination orbit and that's a very important inclination because it means it's accessible from Plesetsk, our more northerly launch site and that means Plesetsk can begin constructing Soyuz as it's got a 350 ton pad currently under construction there and it can take over some of our low earth orbit operations in future because by Kanur we want to focus on the moon. The race for the base has begun and of course the first nation to establish a permanent Kerbal settlement on the lunar surface is going to have worldwide prestige as their reward. Unfortunately, things don't go perfectly to plan with the launch of Salyut 4. The RD-0212 third stage engine of our Yaka launch vehicle fails with about 200 meters per second of Delta V left in it. And there's only 165 meters per second on the station, but thankfully we do just about manage to push ourselves into orbit with the station's thrusters, but it uses the majority of our propellant and this needs to reach 250 kilometers at a minimum to satisfy the contract. So we're going to cut things very very fine but thankfully we have just enough delta v to make it and as you'll see this station is different in that it actually has two docking ports. I'm intending for this station to actually be quite long lived. So we're giving it the capability to have multiple spacecraft visited at once. We've learned our lesson from having to jump Kerbals across from one station to another in the previous episode. And also that allows it to be resupplied by Progress vehicles. We've actually unlocked the Progress spacecraft and we'll be constructing and launching some of those in the next episode, which means we can keep resupplying these stations. We don't have to keep launching new ones every single time we want to fly a mission. Of course, we're going to continue launching our Almaz stations because each of those counts for a quarter of that Photography 3 experiment. All of that uh, <clears throat> weather and terrain photography that those definitely not spy satellites are conducting. However, immediately after launching, we get a warning from Ragatka. That's our mission that has recently flown by Venus, and it looks like Constantine is starting to hear voices. As mentioned in previous episodes, their treadmill broke and they're starting to go a little bit stir-crazy, but it's only 76 days until their maneuver that will set them on a course back to Earth, so they haven't got to hold out too much longer. They should be returning home soon. In the meantime, this is Soyuz 12, and we're launching our first crew to Salyut 4. Now, we reached orbit with Salyut 4 with a mere 10 meters per second of Delta V remaining. That's just enough to keep the attitude control thrusters firing, but not much else. So we are going to probably boost its orbit with a progress vessel at some point and maybe even refuel it. But the Soyuz uses a different fuel mixture than the space station. Soyuz actually uses UDMH and AK-27, whereas the space station uses UDMH and NTO. So that's unsymmetric dimethylhydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide. The Soyuz also uses high test peroxide for its reaction control thrusters. So we can't refuel it from the Soyuz, but perhaps we can load up a progress with fuel and resupply the station just to ensure its longevity going into the future. Now, we actually get a flawless intercept here. You see, just skipping forward a few orbits, really useful tool to do a very efficient transfer over the course of a few orbits, and we get a flawless 0.0 kilometer intercept. And then I realized the intercept is in two days and 15 hours, and the Soyuz T only has enough electric charge for two days and 10 hours. So we're gonna run out of electric charge before we reach the station. So we have to throw away our perfect intercept, lower ourselves into an even lower orbit to catch up with the station faster. I only really pay attention to where the orbit is and launching into the correct inclination as that's obviously by far the most expensive correction to do once you're in orbit. Inclination changes are horrendously expensive Delta V wise. So I don't pay too much attention as to where the station is in its orbit. It turns out we launched 
At pretty much exactly the worst time possible, Salyut 4 was on the opposite side of the planet when we hit orbit, so we only had two days and ten hours to catch up with it, and we cut things a little bit fine using a bit more Delta V than I would have liked. But this is a much more accessible orbit than the one that our Almaz stations are in. Those are in sun-synchronous orbits, which is really difficult to reach unless everything goes flawlessly with a Soyuz on the R11C launch vehicle, whereas this is a lot simpler to reach so we have a bit more delta v wiggle room and we don't have to be quite so sweaty as we're planning our ascent trajectory so i'm planning as i said this station to be quite long lived and i think we're going to have multiple crews perhaps we might have crews up there for six months to a year at a time just do changeovers with different soyuz and i want to send a lot more into cosmos kerbals up in fact we have two such kerbals on the mission today as well as alexi who of course was the first cosmos to set foot on the lunar surface. We have Luna, who's our engineer, and that's one of my Intercosmos Kerbals named by Luna Nicole the Fox. And we have Joanna Kerman, named by Joseph793. Now, both of them are actually from the German Democratic Republic, representing their country proudly, although they were beaten to being the first Germans in space by Peggy Kerman, named by Nico's Black Vespa in the previous episode. On the 1st of July, we spontaneously lose contact with Pogoda 1, our first weather satellite. We then detect a cloud of debris hurtling directly towards our crew aboard Salyut 4. The crew hunker down in their Soyuz as a precaution, but the station is thankfully unharmed. Now, there's nothing aboard Pogoda 1 that could cause it to explode so violently, and taking into account its position over the Gulf of Mexico, we're left with the conclusion that it was destroyed by enemy action. Whether a response to our exposing of a CIA agent two weeks previously, or merely a demonstration of anti-satellite capabilities, the lack of an associated orbital rocket launch showcases that the United States has a terrifying technological lead in space warfare. For now though, the decisions made to classify the report, blame the explosion on a ruptured fuel tank, and avoid any further provocation. But the US Air Force's callous disregard for our orbital infrastructure and the lives of our cosmonauts will not soon be forgotten. So N9 blew one of my satellites out of the sky with an SR-71 Blackbird, which is very impressive, and I'm not gonna lie, I did not see it coming. I saw a bunch of comments saying that it wouldn't produce any space debris because the kill vehicle was on a suborbital trajectory. Just saying, that's not how space debris works. Pogoda 1 was already in orbit, so it would have created a little ring of debris around the planet, and you can take my word for that because I have a degree in modeling this stuff. If you want an example with a similar profile, you can look at the Russian anti-satellite test in 2021, though Pogoda 1 was in quite a low orbit, Bit, so its debris would have deorbited relatively quickly, although Kessler syndrome is not really something we need to worry about in this series. Kessler didn't even propose his theory until 1978. And we're still in 66 and launching another of our SVIT geostationary communication satellite. And this is now the second of our three satellite constellation, which we are lending communications of with the European Space Agency which is led by Carnassa. I've had a lot of comments recently saying, hey, ah, oh, wouldn't it be cool if you added a third person? It's like, we have a third person. Carnassa's playing as the European Space Agency slash Commonwealth Space Commission. So do go check out his videos if you haven't seen them already. The playlist, I'm probably gonna reshuffle so it's not in release order because Carnassa, his last episode doesn't even start until way after this episode finishes. He's a little bit ahead of us time-wise. I've seen a bunch of comments saying he's ahead of you and he should have to stop. Well, that doesn't seem fair. Wow, his, his technology is advancing so fast. No, he's literally further ahead of us in-game time-wise. He's currently in 1967, so he needs to stop for a bit and probably skip an episode so we can catch up to him in in-game time. You can see here though, Lunacod 6 has finally completed its Lunar Rover contract, which is actually the last of its kind, and that gives us a tidy sum for our coffers. And now it's going to be traversing all over the near side of the moon, collecting surface samples from various different biomes to be picked up by a future crewed mission. In the meantime though, just to put this episode in the wider context of the series, we have a launch from the aforementioned Carnassa-led European Space Agency, and this is CHIPS-1. 
1, showcasing the Commonwealth Space Commission, launching from Woomera, Australia, has now made a routine thing of launching large, capable satellites into low Earth orbit. So certainly a potential future partner in crime. I mean, uh, <clears throat> international collaboration. Yeah, there were a lot of memes made of the fact that Carnassus, not last episode, but episode before, in which the launch of Chips 1 occurred, was called International Collaboration, and the following episodes were all about warfare <laughs> and building military aircraft and spacecraft. Unfortunately, Svit 31, which was supposed to complete our geostationary communication constellation, has its RD858 engine explode two kilometers per second short of reaching its final orbit. So it will still operate, but we need to launch another one to complete that constellation. A little concerning, since that's the same engine we use on our lunar landers that we put Kerbals on, so better to have it explode on an uncrewed spacecraft rather than on the scent to the lunar surface. Now we're moving over to Abla Cosmodrome, which we first saw in the last episode, and we're launching Salkovsky 1, and this is our very first, and as far as I'm aware, the world's first probe to Jupiter. And I named it Salkovsky after, of course, Konstantin Salkovsky, the father of astronautics who created the rocket equation. It's a beautiful thing, as Chris Hadfield would say. Of course, that formed a basis of a lot of the stuff I learned on my degree, so I'm a big fan of his work, and I thought I would pay him a tribute. It's also an idea I got from Mars Horizon, of all things, and the design of this space probe is loosely based off of the Salkovsky 1 space probe, which is the bus that you send to the outer planets in that game. I'm looking forward to the sequel to that game. I'm certainly going to be streaming that for the channel. But this is not only going to fly by Jupiter, but a stretch goal of the mission is actually to enter orbit. Now, Everything has to go absolutely perfectly. The Delta V margins of this thing are very slim. Even though we're launching it on R11D because we need a little bit more performance, even that wasn't able to get this payload quite into orbit. We have to burn about a kilometer per second from that fluorine powered upper stage. And that leaves us with six kilometers per second left in that stage, followed by 1300 ish meters per second in the spacecraft itself. And we need about seven kilometers per second to kick us out to Jupiter. And if everything goes perfectly, and we bring in our orbit screaming just over the top of Jupiter's atmosphere, we can get into orbit with about 300 meters per second. A very eccentric orbit, but an orbit nonetheless. So that's what we're going to try and do. But our burn isn't actually for another 39 days. I decided to launch it into orbit ahead of time, just in case something went wrong so we'd have time to build another one. And while we're waiting for that burn to roll around, we actually unlock our first Hydrolox engine, the RD-56, although we're waiting for a much more powerful engine in the next node, which you'll see in the next episode. Unfortunately though, Constantine has now reached the end of his tether and he has a mental breakdown aboard Regatka. And that is a dice roll. A whole plethora of different nasty outcomes can happen, including venting all of the oxygen. But thankfully, we seem to have gotten away scot-free. We roll the dice and we've won. He's calmed down, he's had a few days off, and his stress meter has gone down to 50% with seemingly no bad consequences. So we're now conducting our course correction, bringing us on our trajectory back to Earth. They've only got five months to go and they're setting the timer, crossing the dates off their calendar and willing to get back before any further breakdowns occur. And with us now working on our Hydrolox powered super heavy launch vehicle, we might see them return in the next episode. It takes a few months to build those launch vehicles, so we might see a bit more time encompassed in each episode. We'd long since left behind the year or six months per episode because trying to cram exactly six months or a year in just led to ridiculously long or ridiculously short episodes depending on how busy that particular year was. Before then though, we are launching another space station. This, however, is not a civilian one. We have two more Almaz stations to launch in order to get all of that photography three data. So we need to launch two more, although these are of a slightly different design. As I said, we learned our lesson from the last episode and we now have two docking ports as well, as you can see those missiles that we tested in the previous episode. Of course, this is a military space station. We're doing some shady stuff here. We don't want the Americans coming and inspecting our satellites, particularly in light of recent events. Unfortunately though, we're not having much luck with our RD-0212 third stage engines this episode, as this one fails an entire kilometer per second short of orbit. And that's just simply too much for the station's thrusters to compensate for. So unfortunately, this one is going to die a fiery death over the North Pole and we're going to attempt to launch it again in the next episode along with 
be following our mass station. This launch is entirely classified, so we're just gonna name the next one Salyut 5 as well. So now we can head back on over to Salkovsky 1 at the beginning of October as it's time for its burn to begin. And as I said, this burn has to go perfectly for us to achieve that stretch goal of entering orbit around Jupiter, although even flying by Jupiter would be an amazing achievement in and of itself. And you can see why we research those early RTGs now, because it takes a whole six of them to power this spacecraft. The power output of those RTGs actually decreases over time due to the half-life of the onboard plutonium. So we need six of them to make sure we have enough power to operate our scientific instruments and that two meter wide parabolic antenna when we get out to Jupiter and then for a few more years after that, hopefully, if we're in orbit of Jupiter. We're not doing a gravity assist to any other planets. We don't have a planetary alignment yet. The 77 Voyager window does exist in the game, so we may well launch a Grand Tour mission when that rolls around, but that's not for another 11 in-game years, so a while yet. But thankfully, we complete the burn flawlessly, and we check to see, and we have just enough propellant to enter an eccentric orbit when we reach it in a little over three years' time. But that will be in a future episode. Hopefully next weekend or the weekend after you'll see N9's episode, but Karnasa is going to have to skip a week as I mentioned so that we can catch up to him in in-game time because we want to do some collaborative missions, perhaps send some of his astronauts to Salyut 4. Thanks for watching Penguinauts, I've been the Video Penguin and I'll see you all next time. A massive thank you to my patrons for their generous support, and an extra special thank you to the amazing steak, Dakota Clark, Madzor, Petulus Tinets, Simone67, Scott Milligan, Olaf Hammerhand, Lady Lagsalot, Jesse Smith, NX74656, Jordan Millwood, Luna Nicole the Fox, Frosty Moon, Mr. Blue Star, MCCDTK, and Pormanis Nepeta.